Each of the Gospels have a slightly different flavour to them. Mark's Gospel rushes on with lots of exciting storytelling. Luke's Gospel um, also is a great storytelling Gospel, but it has that element of speaking to a Gentile audience. You can't, don't read very far through the pages of Matthew's Gospel before it becomes clear that Matthew's particular flavour is its deep roots within Judaism. Matthew talks so much about the Old Testament, quoting from the Old Testament, comparing Jesus to Old Testament characters. Matthew's Gospel even uses certain Hebraic phrases, which sometimes don't come over in the English, but are very clearly there in the Greek. So you find um, in the birth narratives that the Magi came and found Jesus and they rejoiced with great joy, which of course leads you to wonder what other kind of joy they might rejoice with. But what you get from that is that it is a clearly Hebraic style of writing. That's how Hebrew expresses its thoughts. And so you get, therefore, that Matthew's Gospel has theological themes that are Jewish, has the way in which it tells its story, which is Jewish. Matthew probably even thought in Hebrew as he was writing into Greek. So you get this kind of very strongly overlay of Judaism within Matthew's Gospel. So the interesting question, therefore, is why such strong Judaism in Matthew's Gospel? Well, there's an obvious answer, and the answer is that Matthew himself was Jewish. But once you get below that question, you get into much more interesting issues. And the big issue that arises as you're reading your way through Matthew's Gospel is actually whether Matthew is suggesting that what he is telling the story of, the story of Jesus, is not just that it is a Jewish story, but what he's presenting is a new Judaism. So you get little strands that come through that suggest that actually what's happening in Matthew's community is a new form of Judaism beginning to arise before your eyes. So let's give some examples to give a, a flavour of that. So right at the start of Matthew's Gospel, you have the words Biblos Genesios of Jesus Christ. And even in that word, you can hear the word Genesis, which is exactly connected to the name of the book of Genesis. And so how, here you have Matthew saying, this is the Genesis of Jesus Christ. As you go through the birth narratives, you encounter a very kind of strongly Old Testament feel. There's certainly resonances of Moses going on throughout the back of the narrative with the references to Egypt and the flight to Egypt and the different quotations from the scriptures that Ma Matthew brings up. Then you get as far as the Sermon on the Mount. And here we have a new person on the top of a mountain receiving a new law, though more than receiving it, giving the new law to his followers. And so therefore you get throughout, running throughout Matthew's Gospel, almost a retelling of the story of the people of God. Now a, pe a, re a retelling of the story of the people of God with the lens of Jesus Christ, rather than as before with the lens of Moses and Abraham and those kind of people. Not, of course, that Matthew was saying that Jesus is against them, but Jesus is a new Moses. Jesus is giving a new Torah on the top of the mountain. So Matthew's strand of Judaism becomes really very clear. Jesus is most clearly a rabbi in Matthew's Gospel, a rabbi who is teaching and communicating the law that you discover as it comes all the way through Matthew's Gospel. And that gets us on to one of the important elements of Matthew's Gospel, which is, of course, the Sermon on the Mount. And what you find in the Sermon on the Mount is really not a sermon. It's probably the most misnamed passage of one of the parts of Matthew's Gospel, because who today would want to hear a sermon that sounded anything like the Sermon on the Mount? The Sermon on the Mount is not a coherent whole that runs from beginning to end, but it's a collection of the small and most important of the sayings of Jesus that we gather together and call the teachings of Jesus. So what you have, therefore, in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus telling the new law to his community. And the new law that he tells um, is surprisingly harsh. So we might sometimes think that Jesus, being the new Moses, would be much more caring, much more gentle, have much less high expectations of his followers than the Mosaic law does. So what we find, therefore, in the Sermon on the Mount is that the commands become much harsher. In the Old Testament, you mustn't commit adultery with a woman. In Matthew's Gospel, you mustn't even look at her. Those kind of examples make you realise that Jesus, the new Moses, has hugely high expectations of his followers. And the new law that he gives expects vast amounts from those who follow him and seek to do what he commands.
So what the strand of Jesus being the new Moses gives us as an understanding of Jesus is that Matthew is presenting very clearly that Jesus is a rabbi, Jesus is a teacher. And it's this strand that runs all the way through. I think you could probably argue that Matthew, more than any of the Gospels, is the teaching Gospel. Here you have Jesus' role as rabbi coming out much more clearly than you do probably in the other Gospels. And one of the fascinating things that many scholars have observed is that actually the Gospel itself appears to fall, down, fall into five major sections with an appendix on the end, though the appendix is the most important part of the Gospel. If we go through the structure of the Gospel, you can begin to see something quite interesting growing up, which is that it begins with a prologue. And the prologue is, of course, the birth narratives getting up to the start of Jesus' ministry. But once you've got to the end of the birth narratives, you then have apparently five sections in which you have a narrative which describes something about who Jesus was, followed by a discourse in which some major teaching takes place. Now, with all of these things, you have to be just a little bit careful. It is quite clear with the, the breakdown that I'm about to present to you that some of them work better than others of them. And there's always a tendency in scholarship to find a pattern that works and to shoehorn it into the rest of the Gospel. And therefore, we just need to treat it slightly cautiously. Nevertheless, it is really interesting to observe that you can find five blocks that follow on from the birth narratives, which go narrative discourse, narrative discourse all the way through. And it's just worth observing them. So we just have a quick look at what those, those are and why they're important. The first one, you encounter the baptism of Jesus in chapter 3, which is followed, of course, by the most clear part of teaching, which is the Sermon on the Mount that I've already talked about. And that block runs from chapter 3 to chapter 7. You then have the second section, in which you have three miracles and two stories of discipleship, followed by a discourse which focuses on mission and suffering. And that section runs from Matthew 8 to Matthew 10. Then you have a third narrative in which there's a conflict between Jesus and his, his opponents, followed by a discourse which is a whole load of parables, uh, which he, um, runs from Matthew 11 to chapter 13, verse 52. The fourth section has increasing opposition to Jesus, so kind of picking up the theme of the first section, followed by a discourse which is the preparation of the disciples for Jesus' absence, Matthew 13, 53 to 18. The fifth section has Jesus' travel towards Jerusalem, followed by a discourse about the end of all things. And uh, there you find that in Matthew 19, verse 1 to chapter 20. I mentioned earlier that you've got a prologue, five sections, narrative and discourse, and then you end with an appendix. Of course, I then corrected myself, and it is important to remind ourselves that the appendix is probably the most important part of the Gospel, which is Jesus' death and resurrection, and that runs from chapter 21 through to the end of the Gospel. And as I also said earlier, it's just reminding, worth reminding ourselves again, is that some of those narratives followed by discourses are much, much clearer than other of them. But what you do get, and therefore what becomes really interesting, is you have this regular pattern of story about Jesus followed by teaching, story about Jesus followed by teaching. So Jesus becomes the teacher all the way through his ministry until you get to the climactic moment of um, going towards his death and his resurrection. And in his death and his resurrection, the pattern of narrative and discourse hangs in our minds. So we are aware that actually the death and the resurrection are teaching us something equally vibrant as the previous five sections were. And what you get, therefore, is Matthew's gospel becoming this gospel of teaching, which I think makes it really rather intriguing as a gospel. So who was Matthew? What can we tell about him? Well, the first thing we need to have a look at is why Matthew's Gospel is called Matthew's Gospel. The answer is that it was attributed to somebody called Matthew probably as early as 125 AD. Um, there, the association is made with a particular person, Matthew. As you go on in Christian history, that association with a person called Matthew becomes very clearly associated with a particular person called Matthew. And in Matthew's Gospel, there is a particular person called Matthew, who is a tax collector. The thing that becomes slightly confusing, however, is Matthew's Gospel is the only Gospel that has reference to somebody called Matthew, who is a tax collector. In Luke's Gospel, the tax collector is called Levi, 
we are then left with some really fa fascinating questions. Did Matthew have another name? Was Levi his other name? Um, were there more than one tax collectors? So actually the reference in Matthew is to one tax collector called Matthew, who is of particular interest because the community knows him, but the other Gospels don't talk about him. And in Luke's Gospel you've got Levi, um, who isn't known to Matthew's Gospel. Um, or um, is it all even more confusing than even that might appear to, to be the case?